In this lesson, we're going to look at the peace conference uh, at Versailles in Paris of 1919, and we're going to ask what did the so-called Big Three want from the peace conference? Well, representatives from many nations were at the Treaty of Versailles, but the three most powerful and influential members of the treaty makers at Versailles were the so-called Big Three, and these were the President of the United States, on the left, Woodrow Wilson, in the centre, the Prime Minister of Britain, Lloyd George, and on the right, Georges Clemenceau of France. There were a number of issues and problems that the treaty makers had to consider while they were making the treaty. And if you look at this picture on the top left, here's a piece of anti-German propaganda from before World War I. But there is something that the Allies have to consider, the, the, the victors have to consider, and that is that this industrial and military power of Germany had managed to wage war for four years and it had taken the combined might of Britain and France, Russia had been defeated and the USA had taken a lot of power to defeat Germany. So what was to be done with this central European power? Something else that was on the minds of the treaty makers at Versailles was Soviet Russia. Lenin had set up the world's first communist state and he had set up the International Comintern with the aim of promoting world communist revolution. So that was something else on the minds of the peacemakers. Something else was that in World War I, Japan and Italy had actually joined in on the side of the Allies, but they joined in in the expectation of gaining a share of the fruits of victory. They expected to get some land out of the Versailles settlement. What would happen if they didn't get what they wanted? And what next for Europe? The picture in Europe has changed completely. The imperial houses of the Austro-Hungarian and German empires have fallen. There's chaos in Germany. At the end of the war, when Austria-Hungary collapsed, new states declared themselves, such as Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia had declared independence. Would the treaty recognise these new countries? So let's look first at Wilson and what he wanted to get out of the Versailles peace settlement. And we can summarise that in the, t in the term, a just peace. These are the words of Wilson, the principle of justice to all peoples and all nationalities. Something that Wilson was especially wanted was something he called self-determination. That is, self-determination means that people who share the same language and the same culture should choose their own governments. In other words, he is against imperialism where one nation dominates other ethnic groups and controls other ethnic groups through colonies. He wants to set up something called the League of Nations. He believes this is an international body which should be able to oversee his just peace. He knows, Wilson, that Britain and France are not going to have the same views, especially, for example, with view to empire and imperialism. But he thinks he's got a good chance of getting what he wants because Britain and France have borrowed a lot of money from the United States during World War I. Now, earlier in January of 1918, Wilson had made his famous 14 points speech. Now, don't worry, you won't have to memorise all of these 14 points, but I'm just going to talk about some of them in some detail, highlight the important ones for our purposes. So, number one was no secret deals, and that relates to point number 14. See your point number 14 on the bottom right here. That was setting up the League of Nations. So, everything should be out in the open, all disputes, all deals should be through, dealt with by this international organisation, this new League of Nations. His second point was freedom of the seas. In other words, the ships of any nation should be able to travel the seas and oceans of the world without being stopped by the navy of any power. Now, this is something that Britain doesn't like, especially as it relies on its Royal Navy to preserve and to protect its large world empire. And something that Lloyd George pointed out was that the, the sea blockade of Germany helped defeat Germany and bring an end to World War I. 
Wilson also wanted international disarmament. He wanted countries to get rid of their weapons as much as possible. Let's look at number five now. Self-determination for the colonies. Again, Wilson wants self-determination. He thinks that the colonies of the, of the world empires should have a chance to move towards governing themselves. Point number five is really not going to be liked by Britain and France. They want to keep their empires. They don't want to lose their colonies. Again, if you look at point number 10, this theme of self-determination runs through the 14 points. Self-determination for these new countries that have declared themselves out of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Again, in the Turkish Empire, self-determination, it runs through what Wilson wants. And overseeing all of this, point number 14, an international peacekeeping body, the League of Nations. Let's look at Wilson's idea of self-determination in a little more detail in terms of how realistic, how practical was it. And it's something that we still struggle with today, actually, this whole issue. If you look at Central and Eastern Europe, this is a map of ethnic groups and languages. And you can see when you look at this map, where do you draw the borders? Wherever you draw the borders, you're going to be left with ethnic minorities from another group inside your country. It's not an easy matter to decide where the borders should lie, how many groups, which groups should get self-determination. So self-determination, a very fine idea in practice, and one that I'm sure we'd all agree with, but where to draw the borders is extremely difficult. So how did Wilson and Lloyd George react when Wilson made his speech in January of 1918? Well, Wilson, sorry, Clemenceau, Georges Clemenceau, the Prime Minister of France, he reacts somewhat sarcastically. Why does he need 14 points when God may do with 10? Here he's kind of poking fun at Wilson's religiousness. Wilson was a very religious man. And he's also saying, look, you're being very idealistic. You're almost trying to be godlike in settling world affairs. And how realistic are your ideas? Are you trying to be like God? Can we be like God? So he's making fun of which Wilson's religiousness and the fact that Wilson is trying to be idealistic and shape the future of the world as well. Um, Lloyd George makes a practical point. We can't accept the second point, that's freedom of the seas. That would mean that Britain would lose the power of blockade, as with other nations. And remember, blockade, the blockade by the Royal Navy, had helped bring World War I to an end. And both of them were annoyed that at no point in the 14 points did Wilson mention something called reparations. Britain and France had spent enormous sums of money on the First World War, and they felt that Germany was largely responsible for the First World War. Germany had planned to pay for the war by taking money and goods from the countries it conquered, whereas Britain and France had borrowed money, and they felt that Germany was responsible and should pay reparations, should pay money to Britain and France. Clemenceau, he wanted a harsh peace. If you look at this cartoon, at the time, people poked fun at Wilson, calling him, calling him the Tiger of Versailles. Now, Clemenceau wanted a harsh peace, but he felt it was justified that he wanted a harsh peace. He also was a leader of a democracy, and as a democratic leader, he had to listen to his people. And the French people wanted revenge. They wanted revenge for World War I. After all, Germany had invaded France, and for their previous defeat in 1871, when France had lost the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. Remember that it was France, alongside Russia, that had suffered most of the death and devastation in World War I. More than a million French soldiers had died in the war, and huge sections of northeast France had been ruined and devastated by the invasion. So there's a huge amount of French destruction, death and debt. What did Clemenceau want? He wanted Germany to be broken up into smaller states. Now, that seems extremely harsh. He wanted Germany broken up. But if you remember the history, Germany did come from a series of smaller states that had united to form this powerful state of Germany. It, Clemenceau felt if it was broken up into smaller states, none of these smaller states would be powerful enough to threaten France in the future. 
Similarly, he wanted Germany, if he couldn't get Germany broken up, he wanted Germany to lose certain parts of its land. He wanted, in the West, Germany to lose the Rhineland and the Saarland. He wanted, in the East, Germany to lose Upper Silesia and East Prussia. These were the main areas of German industry and where it got its raw materials, such as coal, from. So if Germany, again, lost these areas, it would lose its economic, industrial base and it wouldn't be able to wage war on France in future. Well, uh, of the big three, Clemenceau wanted the highest level of reparations and this goes back to the fact that much of the fighting had been in France and France of the big three had definitely suffered the highest level of destruction and debt. Let's look next at Lloyd George. Now he wanted a compromise piece somewhere in between the harshness of Clemenceau and the idealism of Wilson. He wanted a reasonable level of reparations. He had to. More than three quarters of a million British soldiers had died in the battlefields of France and Belgium. There had been an effective anti-German propaganda campaign in England and the British public wanted revenge. Again, like Clemenceau, Lloyd George is the leader of a democracy and he needs to satisfy the desire for revenge of the British public. There was a statement in the House of Parliament that Germany should be squeezed like a lemon until the pips squeak. He didn't though, he didn't want Germany to be too weak because that would leave France with too much power on the European continent. Remember, historically, France was the traditional enemy of Britain and there was some suspicion between those two powers. So if Germany was too weak, it would leave France too powerful. Another problem with a weak Germany, a Germany that was too weak, is that Lloyd George was worried about the threat of communism from the Soviet Union. And he wanted Germany to be strong enough to be a barrier against a potential threat from Russian communism. An economic motive for Lloyd George was that Britain did a lot of trade with Germany. And again, if Germany is destroyed, its economy is destroyed, then Britain's going to lose this potential future trading partner. So he doesn't want Germany to be too economically weak. Another big motivation for Lloyd George is to protect and, if possible, expand the British Empire. He doesn't want the power of the Royal Navy to be lost. And if possible, he'd like to get some of the German colonies also. So in summary, Wilson wanted a just peace. He wanted to set up a League of Nations and he believed in the principle of self-determination. He was worried about a harsh treaty that Germany might want future revenge. Clemenceau felt he deserved, France deserved, a very harsh treaty with Germany. After all, Germany had invaded France, not the other way around, and France had suffered most in the war. Another motive for revenge was the loss of the 1871 wars, and he wanted Germany to be split up into smaller states or lose industrial areas. Lloyd George wanted a compromise peace. He did need to get reparations, the British public demanded it, but he didn't want Germany to be too weak as he felt it would leave France too powerful. He wanted Germany to be a barrier against a potential communist threat from the East, and he also wanted Germany as a future trading partner. OK, so that's a summary of the motivations of the main big three at the Versailles Peace Conference.